Okay, well, I'd like to welcome you to A Connector. My name is Mark Foreman, also known as B Bluesman. That is my Twitter handle, my internet presence handle, if you will, my tag, whatever. Um, so anyhow, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I've been doing this A Connector podcast uh, on and off for, oh, better part of 20 years, more off than on, but more on than off recently. And uh, have a number of different themes. I uh, basically um, here in Taiwan, as you can see on the screen, you're looking at a Wikipedia page, which is titled History of Taiwan. And we'll get into that in a moment. What I'm hoping to do um, lately in the stock market, uh, there's been a lot of things going on with China and overseas um, uh, market, Chinese stocks, st uh, Chinese companies that have their stock listed in overseas markets, and it usually involves uh, an offshore um, account somewhere like the Cayman Islands, something like that. And uh, basically, lately, there's been a lot of activity. And so I, I was kind of motivated to talk a little bit about that, because I think a lot of people really don't understand or don't have much knowledge about what is the difference between Taiwan and China? Are they, are they the same? Are they different? How are they similar? How are they different, et cetera, et cetera? And on that note, let me start it on this thread. I mean, as a young person, prior to having a formal and academic interest uh, in China and or Taiwan to the point of wanting to study it more deeply, I was always kind of confused because when I was a kid, you know, I heard the names um, China, Free China, Democratic China, uh, the Republic of China, the People's Republic of China, Formosa, Taiwan, and Thailand, and knowing that all these places are in Asia, and I think a couple of them are either the same or are related. And I don't know, did I mention Communist China and Red China? If not, I just did it again. But anyhow, the point being, I mean, it's, it's just very confusing. So like, who are we talking about? Who is China? Who is Taiwan? What is the relationship? Okay. So on that note, I mean, we've got the wiki, wiki page open, and uh, basically this is focusing on the history of Taiwan, which is, it says here, this article is about the history of the island of Taiwan. So it's not, uh, not focusing so much on the politics, but more on the physical geographic island. Now, now Taiwan Island uh, is basically located uh, off, off um of the uh, of mainland China, what we call mainland China, which is the bulk of uh, Chinese land. Now, China has another big uh, outer island called um, Hainan Island, and of course, Hong Kong is also an island off off of uh, China. Taiwan is actually probably the furthest away of any of the historical quote unquote uh, Chinese outer islands. Now, there's also some islands that are under control of Taiwan or, okay, let, okay, let me, let me get back to People's Republic of China and, and Republic of China. So I said Formosa, Republic of China, People's Republic of China. Okay. Basically, China historically was all one country, which at one point included Taiwan. I mean, in the history, probably up through the Qing dynasty, which lasted uh, through uh, the late uh, 18th century. Um, and, you know, but it was basically lost. Now, what happened was at one point, this is so this is the old uh, uh, China, which was an empire. Okay, so all the different dynasties are the names of the different uh, dynastic periods of the different emperors of China. So you have many like the Tang dynasty, and the Qing dynasty I mentioned, and the Qing, and the uh, Ming, and the Yuan. I mean, there's, so there's many, many different dynasties. We'll, you know, we're not going to get into that right now. And in each dynasty, you have several different emperors. In the same way, Japan, you have different dynasties. And if I'm not mistaken, I think in Japan is you have a new, a new emperor. They consider that a new dynasty. So anyway, uh, Taiwan at one point got carved away. There was there was a relationship between uh, Japan and the northeastern area of China, which is uh, called Manchuria. And basically, the Japanese annexed Manchuria during the Qing dynasty. 
and they set up kind of a puppet state there. And the the last emperor, if you know the movie, The Last Emperor, he was actually Manchurian. And so they set up a puppet state in Manchuria, and they actually called it Mantuko. And so then in southern China, down um, around, uh, well, central, actually central China, Shanghai, and even further south, uh, that's where you basically had some people uh, like the KMT, the uh, Guomindang, uh, wanting to, and they were, they were basically uh, following uh, Sun Yat-sen, who is credited as being the father of China, and so he's acknowledged by both mainland China, the PRC, and the Republic of China, which is based on Taiwan, as being the father of China. Um, he also happened to be an American citizen, which is another interesting tidbit that maybe someday uh, we'll get onto. But that's not crucial right now. Key point right now is that you had Japanese involvement. You had basically um, the, the nascent Communist Party and the Nationalist Party, which is what the KMT stands for, it stands for the Nationalist Party, uh, that they wanted to basically free China from imper um, imperial rule. Okay, so think in terms of Star Wars, I mean, it's kind of like you had the, um, you know, you had the, the Jedis and those people, the resistance, and you had the, you know, the Empire and Darth Vader and whatnot. So, uh, in, in, in the minds of the nationalists and the communists, you know, basically the imperial China was more like, you know, the empire and Darth Vader and, and the emperor and those guys. Anyway, so there's a lot of activity going on. And finally, there's a revolution in 1911 and the Republic of China was born. And that was led, uh, like I said, that was uh, led by Sun Yat-sen and that was the nationalist party. And at that point, I don't know how active the uh, if there was a communist party, uh, you know, officially yet or not. But basically, it was it started out that way, and so, but at that time, Taiwan was under Japanese control because the Japanese still controlled Manchuria, that was not a part of China that was taken control of by the Republic of China or the Nationalists. Okay, I know it's confusing, but bear with me. Um, anyway, so. Taiwan was still, it was a Japanese colony, basically. I think from, I want to say like 18, mid eight, uh, mid 19th century to the mid uh, 20th century to 1949. And so, and the reason I mention this is because you hear a lot of talk from uh, mainland China or the People's Republic of China claiming how Taiwan is theirs. Technically, uh, the People's Republic of China has never governed on Taiwan. Taiwan has never been part of the People's Republic of China government or reign. Now, uh, they seem to uh, think they have a claim to it based on, uh, you know, uh, previous history, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it's open to debate. So it's a very uh, complicated situation. What makes it even more complicated is Chiang Kai-shek, who was the leader of the Nationalist Party, uh, towards uh, getting closer to World War II, the Japanese were in China, both the nationalist Chinese and the uh, communist Chinese uh, both wanted to get rid of the Japanese and get them out of China because the Japanese had committed a lot of atrocities uh, in Nanjing. And, uh, you know, basically the, the, the Chinese communists, for the most part, uh, were uh, peasants, uh, you know, uh, farmers and peasants and um you know, so, you know, the working people, more educated people uh, were probably more affiliated with the Nationalist Party. And so essentially, uh, they, they worked together, the Nationalists and the, and the Communists worked together for a while to defeat the Japanese to get them out of China. And once they su succeeded there, then they started fighting uh, between themselves. And so finally, uh, the, there was such a uh, a, a growth movement to the, uh, the the communist party, and they were just talking and convinced, you know, the common people. Look at all the injustices injustices under the nationalist party, and how they're the party of business, and and actually too, they they do have a background in the, one of the main main gangs in China, the the Green Gang, and uh, you know, so more and more people were convinced, uh, you know, to to join with the communist cause. And so they ended up fighting with the nationalists and nationalists lost the KMT and John Kai-shek and all of his KMT followers, a lot of the soldiers, a lot of the treasures from China, a lot of the gold, a lot of the artworks, most of them all came to Taiwan. 
And uh, so basically the whole plan from that point on, so they said, okay, so now they were the government, they were the, uh, the, the elected or recognized government in China before the communist one, and they declared China as being under the People's Republic of China, okay, which was the Communist Party ruling. And then the KMT, the nationalists came to Taiwan and they declared, okay, the Republic of China, which was the legitimate government in China, is now based on Taiwan. And the whole point was they were going to wait in Taiwan and regroup with the idea of taking China back. So they had like two, um, they had two uh, main uh, points of this. So they had the most of them here in Taiwan and uh, setting up a government here and taking uh uh, taking the island back uh, because they defeated when uh, Japan was defeated during World War II, then part of the deal that uh, the ROC made with the U.S. and uh, was to get Taiwan back uh, under their control. So Jap Japan relinquished the control of Taiwan to the Republic of China. And um, so basically uh, the ROC government also had a plan to uh, they had a group of people in, in Burma, and uh, actually a lot of uh, the people in Burma, well, some of them uh, probably got into the heroin cultivation and heroin trade as a means of raising and maintaining funds, because the whole idea was to have like a pincer. So uh, Taiwan from the east, and then Burma, uh, the troops in Burma from the south would, would, would basically attack China at the same time on two different flanks. And uh, that never happened. And so obviously the PRC has been under control of the, of the uh, Communist Party since, um, like I said, 1949 and uh, you know, to this date now. But uh, there's just a whole lot of convoluted uh, history and treaties and whatnot and third parties like the US uh, and the Japanese that were involved to make the matter even more complicated. And John Kai-shek, uh, basically choosing uh, to have the Republic of China leave the United Nations during the 70s and relinquish their seat. And, what, and then the People's Republic, Republic of China came in and claimed that seat. And so that, that didn't really help Taiwan's cause in, in terms of uh, proving and establishing legitimacy. So it's just been a whole confusing mess. Uh, but to make a long story short, you have uh, Taiwan economically developed uh, ahead of China, uh, had a good relationship with the United States. Uh, during the Vietnam War, there were um, uh, army bases here in Taiwan uh, uh, under the approval and permission of the Republic of China government. And of course, uh, you know, one hand, one, uh, one hand washes the other. Uh, you know, the U.S. government made, uh, you know, did some, did some things to benefit uh, the government gave a lot of funds and helped them. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the bases the U.S. government built and left here became uh, bases, uh, you know, for the local government, et cetera. And uh, they, you know, they shared, you know, they shared some of the wealth. I mean, they basically paid their rent. And uh, they also said, OK, you know, because you're a good partner, you're a good ally. You know, we're going to open up some trade opportunities for you in the U.S., and they gave them the whole idea and the whole path forward, say, hey, look, you know, you've been pretty much an agricultural society. Uh, you know, U.S. has already got a good consumer uh, economy. And, uh, you know, there's probably an opportunity for you to provide a lot of products at, at uh, competitive prices, uh, you know, and uh, you can do uh, we'll, we'll open up the doors and you can start trading more with the U.S. and that'll help your economy grow, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was uh, probably late 60s when the seeds were, were sown for that. And uh, when I came here in 1987, that was just at the point of the repeal of martial law. Uh, at that point, Jiang Kai-shek had already uh, died. His son, uh, Jiang Jingguo, uh, was a president. And so he proclaimed the repeal of martial law. So it was like basically the economy was booming. They were already getting big into export. Um, they were becoming, they opened up, they, they basically set their course for democracy because there was one opposition party. There's a two-party uh, state. Basically, 
the KM2 who have mentioned uh, so far, the Nationalist Party, and the DPP, which is the Democratic Progressive Party, which was illegal. Okay, and they were also, and the reason they were illegal is because they had a lot of background, a lot of their members were, were basically uh, Taiwan independence uh, minded. And so that was uh, not, not uh, accepted by uh, the uh, Republic of China uh, Nationalist Party, nor is, it, uh, nor is it accepted or approved upon uh, by the People's Republic of China. So that'll kind of give you a little bit of background, hopefully make a little bit more sense. So you can see, see on the page, let's get back to some of the history. So it says uh, the island of Taiwan dates back tens of thousands of years, the earliest known evidence of human habitation. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because uh, if you're an American or North American, a lot of the history of North America, you're going to see some of the same names here, this, the same uh, the usual suspects. So the, the sudden appearance of a culture based on agriculture around 3000 BC is believed to reflect the arrival of the ancestors of today's Taiwanese indigenous peoples. Okay, so you can see the Taiwan indigenous peoples, Formosan people, or we call them Austronesian. Basically, these people and all the people or the South uh, Sea Islander people, people in Hawaii, and for that matter, more than likely, the, the First Nations people of Canada, the Inuit of uh, Alaska, uh, the, Nat the Native Americans or erroneously named Indian people, American Indian people of uh, North, Central, and South America are all related and basically started out here in Asia. Okay, so then we get uh, colonization by the Dutch in the 17th century, good old Dutch. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, which used to be a Dutch colony. A lot of you don't know maybe that New York used to be New Amsterdam. So lo and behold, the Dutch were active, not only coming to the West, of uh, Europe going to America, but also coming over to Asia. They were very active in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, even far down in uh, Southern Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So then it says it was followed by an influx of Hoklo people. Now, Hoklo is the, um, yeah, there's many dialects of Chinese languages, a lot of different Chinese languages. So in the local language of the Taiwan people, Hoklo just means the, the people from uh, Southern Fujian, where most of them are fun, uh, from. And so Southern Fujian is basically right across from Taiwan on the coast of mainland China, the areas like Xiamen, and uh, uh, there's islands that are uh, Jinmen and, and Mazu that are very close to there. And Fuzhou is kind of like the northern end of, of uh, Fujian province, but that they speak a little different language. Anyway, so also you have some Hakka immigrants, now, Hakka is another uh, subculture, another subgroup of Chinese people, originally probably coming from central China, but they emigrated uh, down south. And it literally means guest people. They tend to, in a lot of ways, a lot of people refer to them as kind of the Jews of the Chinese. Uh, they tend to be minorities, but they uh, often are uh, discriminated against. And, and uh, uh, so they're very clannish and they tend to uh, be good at collecting political power and working together. And uh, so that's it. And the, the body of water between Taiwan and China is called the Taiwan Strait or the Strait of Taiwan. Now, before I go on, the main reason why does China want Taiwan so badly? It's not for love of Taiwan's people or feeling that there's some sense of nostalgia. Oh, it's so good if China and Taiwan are back together again. It's basically geopolitical. The location of Taiwan, uh, General MacArthur, uh, said that Taiwan is just a permanent aircraft carrier sitting there right in the uh, uh, North China uh, Sea. And so basically any ship activity from Southeast Asia or coming even from India around and up through Southeast Asia is going to pass right, right by Taiwan. Uh, and so like J Japan needing any resources from down south, it's going to come right past Ch uh, uh, Taiwan. So it's a very, very, very strategic location. And that's why all the heightened interest uh, and uh, driving the rhetoric and their stubborn insistence that Taiwan belongs to them and that they're dead set on reuniting uh, Taiwan and China. And I'm not saying that I'm opposed or, 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 or in favor. I'm just giving, I'm just giving the facts. And uh, anyway, 
So that's kind of what the situation is. Two entirely different governments, two entirely different systems. Taiwan is really, really very democratic. Um, I mean, so much so that, you know, uh, sometimes people here will joke almost too democratic because there's just so many differing opinions that are freely shared. And, um, you know, the Taiwanese and the Chinese, for that matter, too, they have a lot of, you know, go-getter kind of attitude, uh, kind of like, you know, they're very industrious and they're very crafty. Uh, you know, so if they have a little bit of opportunity, they're going to do their best to make that into a big opportunity. And some of them have been very successful. Uh, some of the companies you probably know well, like uh, Taiwan, um, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor um, and uh, Foxconn and Giant Bicycle. And for that matter, I'll say NVIDIA, although NVIDIA, I believe, is incorporated as U.S. corporation, but its CEO, who's really a rock star, Jensen Huang, he's from here. Uh, so many people uh, in the high tech business, uh, uh, you know, are from here or the children of people that came from here, like uh, Steve Chen that started uh, YouTube, um, Perry Chen, that was one of the founders of Kickstarter, um, a guy that recently uh, passed away, the guy that started, well, he didn't start, but he basically grew, uh, uh, um, not Skechers, but I said Zappos. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've talked to him a number of times. I'm just trying to think of his name. It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, but he passed away um, last year. I mean, on and, I mean, there's, there's a lot. There's, so there's a lot of well-known uh, high-tech companies. Uh, at, you know, Foxconn is like the major OEM uh, for Apple and uh, other, uh, other computer and uh, uh, tech uh, technological hardware companies, et cetera. Okay, so I think that gives you uh, some background and could probably help a little bit. And we'll continue to talk to this, about this over a period of time. Um, and uh, it should be uh, a little bit more clear. I will put the link to this Wikipedia page uh, in the show notes so you could come and, come and look at it uh, on your own when you have time. Um, but now where I want to go before we conclude for today, I don't want to, you know, overrule me too much information. Um, what I want to do is I want to use, okay, I should mention that uh, I, I'm going to talk about uh, a security product that, um, um, that I invest in. It's, a, it's an ETF, uh, an exchange trans, um, transfer fund, and it's called EWT. Uh, which is a fund by iShare, which is part of BlackRock. And, but I'm not a professional advisor. I'm not giving any recommendations on investing or not investing. I'm sharing this information purely for the sake of information uh, and uh, entertainment and education. And that's that. But I just want you to know that I, I am invested in that. And I'm going to use that as a lens. And why I'm going to do that is because in, in this uh, ETF, and I didn't, I don't have it open right now. Um, but basically, it's got the majority of the major industrial uh, powers, companies, names uh, here in Taiwan, including Taiwan uh, Semiconductor, including, including all the ones I've mentioned and haven't, uh, Jiangshin Tire, which uh, makes Maxis, and Acer, um, and Formosa Chemical. Uh, you know, and on and on and on. And we'll get to that. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about that. And I'd like to talk about the individual companies within that bundle, within that portfolio, uh, because I think it would give some better understanding. And I'd like to uh, highlight a little bit, because like I said, it's just so confusing to most people. Taiwan, China, isn't it all the same? And, you know, and certainly for investments, I think, you know, Taiwan and the Taiwanese companies are much more uh, followers of the uh, rule of law model. Uh, I think it's a lot less uh, mercurial, uh, a lot more um, stable, if you will, uh, a lot more like probably the U.S. In, in, in some ways and hopefully some of the good ways and probably also to some of the bad ways. And you can, you can decide whatever that means. But anyway, uh, I hope to uh, enlighten a little bit. And uh, I want to mention too that uh, one of the uh, well, the sponsor of, of uh, these uh, casts, or one of the sponsors, uh, is my company, which is um, Marlin and Sons, and we're involved. We, we do um, 
uh, basically uh, market, uh, market assistance for companies that want to develop their brand, uh, their uh, branded products here in Taiwan or looking for uh, uh, partners here to do that. Uh, and also we provide technical uh, sourcing services and due diligence services uh, for uh, companies that want to uh, purchase from here or do strategic, do technical products here. We have a lot of experience in doing that. Uh, when I first came here, uh, one of the first jobs I had was for an American fishing rod company uh, that uh, was doing uh, a lot of uh, composite material, uh, composite fiber um, fishing poles and uh, golf shafts. And um, so I was working in there and they also did their own hardware for the fishing. And I was working in there and in fact, this is before, this is like when computerization was just getting going. Let's say it was like 1998-ish. No, I'm sorry, 1988-ish. So I'm, I was an expediter and I'm supposed to be tracking over 400 something. No, there was about 800 different SKUs, stock keeping units in that factory. No barcode system, no RFID. Uh, the computer printouts I got, if, if they were quick, they were probably four or five days old. So things had already moved, you know, something I'm tra trying to track down that was said, oh, this was in whatever department could have easily moved to another department. So it was like, it was a fascinating time and a lot of it in, in uh, a very daunting way. Chinese have a saying, may you, live may you live in interesting times, which is really kind of a curse because in their view, interesting means like, you know, a big headache means like a lot of, you know, crazy stuff is going on. And it was pretty crazy, but it was a great experience. Uh, it was my first uh, ever experience working in a factory. It opened up my eyes a lot and realizing how much quality stuff was made in Taiwan. And I never realized that before because it was always in small letters, small words like made in Taiwan and fine print. And these were like big branded U.S. companies like Wilson Sporting Goods and Spalding and, and Berkeley and Fenwick, the two, uh, there were two brands of the company I, I was working for, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, that's where I started out. And so I had a lot of experience. That was my first experience too. And I was fascinated with composite fiber, carbon, fiberglass, resin, uh, injected plastic, and then later precision metals. So I have a lot of background in that. And uh, so, yeah, we're still very much involved in providing those services. And like I said, uh, uh, we're not a trading company and we're not just looking, oh, you know, you want this. So let's say, you know, I'll find that and I'll add three cents to it and, and sell it back to you. You know, we're much more strategic and we're much more or the value that we add is uh, definitely in the relationships that we have and the relationships that we build and the quality standard of the people that we work with, uh, because that's really, you know, some of the key factors. You don't want to be changing suppliers, you know, willy nilly, especially in these times with all the complexities resulting from the pandemic and uh, the mess in the supply chain and shipping, et cetera. So didn't want to make that uh, a long ad about my business, but just kind of give you a little bit of background. And uh, so, you know, it is germane. So we're very, very much uh, involved with, um, you know, companies here. And I've got some friends that will join as guests from time to time. We'll be doing some different episodes uh, with people from some of these companies and some of the bigger companies as well to give some more uh, insight into their company, new products, new technologies. Uh, and uh, you know, etc. So I hope that's interesting to you. I will keep you updated. And uh, for the time being, I think we'll just call it a day. So this is Mark saying thank you. Appreciate your time. Uh, let your friends know. Please subscribe. Hit the like button. You know, I have to get in the habit. Of, yeah, hit that like button. Subscribe. All that good stuff. I mean, basically, just so I just kind of get on the radar over there on YouTube, and it helps you remember. It helps other people find it. And it just, uh, yeah. It's a good thing to do. So on that note, I'm going to say thank you and uh, call it a day for now. And I will be back soon. So cheers. Bye-bye.